Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to you to this Private Law and Intellectual Property Conference. Um, and thank you for staying with me from almost a year ago until now with my repeated emails, reminders, and uh, just this journey from uh, almost a year ago. Um, this conference, um, I thought about this conference almost five years ago when uh, I was putting together a funding proposal for Live Hume Trust. And uh, um, one of the advice, one of my advisors gave me this uh, idea that I should be as ambitious as I want to be because this funder is going to actually appreciate the fact that um, you've, uh, you've really put your heart into the, uh, the funding proposal. So I just sat down and I said, who are the people I want to see in one room? I went through some names and I put it down and I put it in the proposal and lo and behold, we are here today. Um, it took a long time, um, obviously, with the uh, COVID intervening. Um, th this conference should have taken place in 2021 um, and for obvious reasons, uh, it's been postponed, but we're here, we're, we're here exactly where we needed to be and exactly doing what we love doing. A very warm welcome to you all. Um, I will not take too much of uh, more time. I'm going to hand over to Jonathan Morgan, our vice chair um, at the Law Faculty Board, um, and he will take the proceedings further. Jonathan, over to you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. And um, the first thing to say is a huge welcome uh, to all of you from um, the Cambridge University and the Faculty of Law, where I'm, as Paul said, the Deputy Chair of the Faculty Board. And um, what better place could there be than Cambridge for a conference um, with this title? Intellectual property is one of the faculty's very great strengths. And although I'm not myself an intellectual property lawyer, I always <coughs> tend to think deep down that that's what Cambridge law really is about. Uh, the first time I ever entered this building um, was to be interviewed for my first ever academic position by Professor W. R. Cornish. Um, I got the job. It wasn't one in intellectual property law, I should, I should say. Um, Bill was the first holder of the Herschel Smith chair in intellectual property law, and Lionel Bentley's predecessor um, in that chair. Uh, he died, Bill died last year, and we had a memorial for him earlier this year where it's obvious what um, a pioneer he was in the subject of intellectual property, certainly in the, in the English or the, the Anglo Commonwealth world. Um, and Bill's work is, of course, taken on by, by many colleagues in the faculty today, and, and we'll be hearing more from them later in the conference. I might not be an intellectual property lawyer, uh, but I am a private lawyer. And perhaps it's worth saying, for the benefit of the uh, non-English members of the audience, um, what private law is like in England. It remains heavily doctrinal. Talking about black letter law is not necessarily here a term of abuse. Um, it could be seen <laughs> merely as a plain description, and it might even be a term of approbation. If the authors of the Holmes Pollock letters were with us today, um, I think that they would instantly find English law recognisable, perhaps less so than law in the United States, where many of our conferees um, are from. Holmes surely would have approved of the uh, post-realist approach in US law today. I'm not sure whether Pollock would have done or, or even really understood it. And that's how um, private law is, is thought about still in the English courts, by the judges and by counsel. Um, and so inevitably for scholars, when we are uh, teaching our students and writing about law, we cannot ignore the way that it's understood by practitioners. But I have to say this sort of doctrinal scholarship is not merely that it might be seen as old fashioned, um, but it's somewhat beleaguered in the academy. We are all, all scholars, all academics, are now encouraged to become um, interdisciplinary. And that's not just a fashionable slogan. Well, actually, I think it is just a fashionable slogan, but <laughs> whether we like it or not, um, it's, it's forced upon us, not quite at the point of a gun, um, but at the point of British government funding for research, which is nearly 
as bad. <laughs> now, I've not come to speak necessarily uh, against interdisciplinarity in all of its forms. I think it's clear that many, perhaps all areas of law, do lend themselves to social scientific methods, looking at the law in action, looking at the incentives it creates for behaviour, and I hardly need even mention that to an audience of intellectual property lawyers and the economic incentives that the rules create. On the other hand, I think it is begging a pretty big jurisprudential question to say that that is the only and the exclusive way that we should think about law. It neglects the internal point of view, law's self-understanding, if we don't place actually a pretty heavy, heavy emphasis on um, doctrinal understandings. Now, that all sounds um, a bit reactionary, but even the driest formalist, even a lawyer with the deepest commitment to doctrinal scholarship, has to admit that there is one particular sense of interdisciplinarity that we can all heartily accept, and that is connections within the discipline of law to look at the relationships between different departments of law. Now, as law grows in size and complexity, it's very difficult for teachers and scholars to teach or write about many different areas um, of law. Um, but we should note that all of our students and indeed our senior judges um, in the generalist courts that we have are all generalists. So perhaps scholars um, shouldn't find it impossible to, to look at different subjects. Anyway, it's a splendid contribution of this particular conference uh, to attack the silo mentality, which pre presupposes that there is some thick dividing line or some unbridgeable gap between IP law and the remainder of private law. It's not for me to try and say what IP law can learn from private law. I see that a number of papers uh, over the next two days are going to do just that, addressing, for example, ideas of um, implication in the law of contract, of rights and permissions of, of an intellectual property character. The idea of possession of data rather than physical things. The notion of reliance that we see in many areas of private law and what that can tell us about trademarks or the idea of um, IP infringements as a kind of tort. But I can venture um, a few words on what private lawyers might gain from thinking about IP law. It's very fashionable in private law theory, as I'm sure you all know, to think and write about rights. And obviously the important consequences um, flow from that emphasis on rights, but the structure of the law, permissible forms of reasoning about it, the remedies and, and for much more. But less emphasis is being placed by private law theorists on what these rights are or what they should be and how they are derived and from what sources and to what ends. I must immediately accept my Cambridge colleague Nick, Nick McBride who's here today because he's written a lot about that but there are many other private law theorists um, who I will not name who I think corroborate my point. But for IP lawyers obviously these questions are front and central. Whether the rights that we refer to as intellectual property should even exist at all as a legally protected category is a live question in a way that I think ownership of land or other physical things or a right to a contractually promised performance, these are not seriously questioned or couldn't seriously be questioned, I think. The IP law is very different because partly it's newer but partly it, it is socially and legally much more controversial. So an IP lawyer does have to decide on and defend the basis for the rights on which their subject depends. And naturally, there's a flourishing debate about how we should go about doing that, whether the justifications for IP rights ought primarily to be instrumental, such as economic incentives, or should be based um, on perhaps moral rights. Tomorrow's paper on personhood theories of authorial rights will explore aspects of that approach. In short, it seems to me that IP lawyers have moved on from um, the potentially somewhat banal claim that their subject is about rights onto the more important and I think more interesting business of interrogating what those rights are, how strong they should be, against whom they should lie, and with what remedial consequences. But in short, I hope both IP lawyers and private lawyers will benefit greatly from the conversation that we're to have over these 
two days. I have a number of important and heartfelt thanks to give. First, to Columbia Law School's program on science, technology, and intellectual property law, uh, which through the good offices of Professor Balganesh um, have co-sponsored the conference with the Cambridge Law Faculty. <coughs> Many thanks indeed. And funding has also come, and I think we have the, the logos here on the screen, um, from the Cambridge Centre for Intellectual Property Law, the Cambridge Centre for Private Law, and not least from the Leverhulme Trust. And there are many people that need to be thanked too. I cannot name all of them now, but I would like to mention uh, Andrew Leaker for all of his help with the logistics of the event. But above all, I must thank and indeed pay tribute to Dr. Porna Mysore. This event is Porna's brilliant idea, brought to splendid fulfillment after literally years in the planning, as Porna mentioned in her introduction. So Porna, thank you for bringing all of us together for this magnificent conference. So again, and finally, I welcome all of you, uh, and in, in particular, I offer a redoubled welcome to Professor Henry E. Smith of Harvard Law School, where he's the Fessenden Professor of Law, Director of the Project on the Foundations of Private Law. Uh, Professor Smith truly is a doyen of property lawyers and property theorists, and as such, he needs certainly no further introduction from me, uh, but merely our thanks for attending um, this conference in the other Cambridge. So with that, I declare this conference <laughs> I declare this conference formally open and I, I invite Professor Smith to give his keynote lecture, The Private Law Architecture of Intellectual Property. Thank you. So thank you, Jonathan, uh, for the uh, wonderful introduction and uh, thoughtful uh, introductory remarks. I, I think I may pick up where you left off. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, in the original Cambridge. Uh, and uh, let me thank uh, Porna for organizing this wonderful conference. Uh, this is uh, really an incredible lineup. Uh, and also thank uh, Sham uh, as well uh, for uh, organizing this. This is uh, truly an incredible occasion. Uh, and I really look forward to the, uh, the papers. I also look forward to talk, giving this, these initial remarks uh, because this is a topic that is very close to my heart, or actually two topics that are actually uh, come together, which is private law and uh, intellectual property. Uh, and it's uh, to anticipate some of my, uh, my um, uh, the, the point here, is when you bring these two things together, it's not that you have private law and you have IP, and wow, they're just together. Uh, they, uh, there's actually some uh, synergy in terms of uh, looking at them together. So again, this is a wonderful uh, occasion to do so. So uh, let me start uh, with uh, some sort of conventional slogans uh, that um, are out there, and they have some truth to them, uh, but they're often, uh, often overblown uh, or vastly overblown uh, that relate to our topic of this, uh, this uh, event. Uh, so I'm going to focus on property, but this applies, I think, to private law in general. But um, in particular, when we talk about intellectual property, uh, property has, uh, has a bad name. Uh, the, a, so there's a lot of um, uh, skepticism about intellectual property as property. Uh, there's skepticism about the role of property thinking in intellectual property. Uh, and this is uh, not just a matter of property alone. Relatedly, I think there's, uh, and this maybe relates more to private law, a skepticism about system in both property and private law, uh, maybe coming out of especially uh, legal realism that system means rigidity, it means deduction, it means the autonomy of law in a very, uh, a very strong sense and so forth. Uh, so what I'm going to argue is that uh, this reflects a, a, a problematic notion of system, uh, that there are a variety of notions of system, and one problem is actually defining system in the first place, but the kind of system that we should understand private law to be, uh, and property in particular, is a different kind of system. Uh, and it's not homogeneously formal. It's not deductive. Uh, but instead, it's a complex system. And I'll talk about what that means. But seeing it that way means that we can start talking about how to manage uh, complexity, how to accommodate flexibility and uh, allow for uh, dy dynamism and evolution uh, in, in the law. So the kind of system that I'm interested in is not 
formal. It's not completely anti-formal. It's, it's a mixture. It's semi-open. It's loosely connected. It's modular, but not completely. All of these uh, dimensions are a matter of degree, uh, and, we need to, um, uh, and uh, we need to get a handle on uh, where uh, we want to come out on that. Um, now, I'm going to set this up uh, in this kind of general way, but I'm going to move quickly to uh, three applications, and these are three uh, important uh, non-exclusive applications. Uh, there are many potential others. Uh, I noticed sort of by happenstance, uh, sort of happy uh, coincidence, that these applications are related to a lot of the papers that are uh, to come, so uh, the synergy is maybe uh, going to happen there too. But I'll talk about the conversion of intangibles, uh, which uh, is an inherently interesting subject, uh, but it's also uh, a, uh, a matter that uh, we're taking up with the uh, fourth restatement of property, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, what I call equitable near property, uh, so how equity allows for rights that are somehow, and let me emphasize somehow, between in personam and in rem, and finally uh, the contract property spectrum in IP, which includes uh, licensing and so forth. Uh, so... So I said that uh, system is kind of the linchpin here. What, would, what do we mean by that? Um, and again, it's associated with uh, deductive legal science. Uh, sometimes the name Langdell gets thrown around, although I think actually Langdell was uh, not as um, formalistic as people say, but that would be a totally uh, different talk. Um, uh, and I'm not endorsing uh, Langdellianism but, uh, uh, or legal science. Uh, on the contrary, um, I think this is just kind of a, a misconception of the way uh, private law has to work, um, and but the idea was that uh, system you know, means something like that, and that that is too rigid for uh, increasing social, economic, and technological complexity, which is very much uh, it, to the fore in IP. Um, but if we take uh, a step back and look at this in the light of complex systems theory, things look different. Uh, so what is a system? Well, at the most general level, a system is a collection of interconnected elements, and these can be modeled by networks. Uh, and what makes a system complex is not just the number of elements. So, yeah, if you have very few elements, that's not, not going to be complex. But it's not just that there are many elements, but that they're densely interconnected. And because of their dense interconnection, uh, all sorts of things can happen. Uh, and the properties of the system can be different from the properties of individual elements. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult or potentially practically or some people would say in principle impossible to trace system uh, uh, properties, these emergent properties, down to uh, the micro level. Uh, so all sorts of systems are like this. Uh, cars, software, social networks, and so forth have properties. You know, the function of a car even is something that you can't uh, say comes from, oh, this is that component and so forth. Uh, and there are certainly... Uh, other examples. Uh, a, a, an extreme example would be uh, models of uh, consciousness uh, as uh, an emergent property of uh, brains. Okay, so complexity though is not just on or off. It's not that, well, once you've passed the th certain threshold, now it's com complexity time. It's uh, actually uh, a big spectrum uh, with simplicity on the one hand and sort of maximal complexity uh, on the other, uh, maybe even in some, in some cases chaos. So uh, in simplicity involves the number of interconnections in the system being small enough so that it is possible to trace uh, the contributions of, uh, trace properties back to where they come from on the micro level. Uh, the simplest system would be where all of the elements just do their thing and contribute additively to the properties of the system. Uh, but if you have maximal connection of the elements, then, you know, the ripple effects uh, just go everywhere, uh, and um, that's the opposite extreme. Whereas a lot of systems, and I would argue uh, property and private law, are in this uh, middle part of organized complexity, uh, to use the term that uh, Warren Weaver coined in 1948, where there are a lot of connections but not maximal connections. There may even be patterns to the connections so that you could actually see the potential components of the system, maybe even proto-modules of the system. So you can actually get some sense about what might happen if you do certain things. But still, it's uh, a difficult problem. But it's not, it's not super simple. But it's not as if anything goes. Uh, and that leads to the idea of uh, system architecture. So many systems, including cars, are 
organized into modules so that if you tinker with the windshield wiper system, you don't have to worry about the impact on the brakes and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, if you can discover, and there are algorithms for this, to discover chunks of the system that are internally intensely uh, interconnected but only loosely connected with other components, that's a modular system. And it, that's a matter of degree. I mean, how, how, um, how much that ratio is um, can be measured. Uh, and this has been used in uh, all sorts of um, uh, context, uh, originally this was most truthfully used in uh, sociology, but it's now uh, used all over the place. Uh, and one important aspect of this is within a certain range, uh, this means that systems are easy to evolve. Think about redesigning a car. If you want to, re as I just mentioned, if you redesign the windshield wipers, you don't have to uh, think uh, intensively about the brakes. You can actually take out the, the, the system of windshield wipers, put another one in, and as long as it satisfies the interface conditions, uh, of a windshield wiper system, uh, you now have a car that's been uh, improved, uh, even though it's a complex system. Uh, and uh, the w one uh, thing about the, you know, this is uh, something I'm not going to get down into in great detail. One aspect of property theory is uh, the famous bundle of rights picture uh, can be understood in different ways. And if we understand it as a bundle of sticks, to use that metaphor, uh, the problem there is that in a real bundle of sticks, the sticks don't really interact with each other very much. You know, they're tied together, but, uh, you know, uh, the sticks are very minimally interacting. And that's not a very good picture of property because the, uh, the various entitlements that make up the bundle, if you will, uh, are much more interactive. Um, and that does give us a different picture. So property is a system. Uh, so uh, Ironically, these system interactions, you know, so if you think about property and land, if you have the, the right to uh, moisture and the right to, um, uh, the right to uh, uh, aeration features, you have the right to a certain volume and so forth, uh, these are interacting uh, and that may explain some traditional doctrines. It does not get us all the way to absolute rights or anything, but it does suggest that um, uh, thinking about you know, pens and land and so forth as things uh, may be a, a f good first approximation because uh, these are not just bundles, they're actually very uh, interactive. Um, and that leads us to think about basic forms of property like uh, uh, how they're standardized, uh, and I've written a lot about the numerous clauses with uh, Tom Merrill, um, the idea that these um, basic forms should be interoperable, you should be able to combine them and so forth, uh, you should be able to uh, feed them into each other so you can have, well, uh, uh, in our system we ha have, uh, you know, multiple life estates and so forth. Uh, or if you think, I'll get to the trust uh, later, uh, you, can th you can sort of build all sorts of generative uh, structures with these. And I will talk in this, uh, in this um, uh, setting here a little bit about possession and also about pos what possession isn't. Um, but certainly possession keys off modular things. You know, I'm holding this pen you know, that's a social fact, but there are legal uh, conclusions that are built off that, uh, but they do, um, they do presuppose that a pen is, uh, is a thing and so forth. Um, and uh, possession itself allows then for a certain kind of um, uh, simplicity that gives rise to complexity. Uh, possession runs through property. Uh, certainly when we're uh, working on the restatement, uh, we noticed very interestingly how uh, different approaches to the idea of possession are uh, have been used in the past in past torts restatements, uh, but also in terms of uh, the legal theory out there. Uh, the entire kind of history of uh, sort of applied jurisprudence uh, is um, encapsulated in the idea of possession, uh, which is, uh, we'll see a little bit of today. Uh, okay, so the system here is I, I'm going to emphasize not deductive, not uh, is semi-open, not uh, homogeneous, uh, and so, like for instance, possession concepts, as I just mentioned, uh, you know, there, th we need a somewhat articulated set of them. Uh, the sta status of possession is different from the right to possess. You know, I can be out of possession but have the right to possess. Courts tend to confuse these. Uh, that's why the vo vocabulary of possession is so confused. Uh, it's also the case that, and I think property professors are very guilty of this, uh, that um, you know, what constitutes possession as a social fact is like thrown into the mix as well. And the idea that as a matter of book learning, we're going to say you know, like, how, exactly how much control you have to have over a fish to say it's yours 
is, uh, I think, not uh, fruitful uh, to do, um, but it's fun. Uh, and um, but if if you think there's like this possession with a capital P that's going to cover everything from the social fact to the right to possess. Uh, you're going to have problems, um, and so we, it needs to be more articulated. And I think when intellectual property comes into the mix, that's even more uh, true. Um, and I, so we're, we're talking about a system that heavily relies on social facts, uh, and uh, even within the system, uh, this is not homogeneous. So, like property is uh, property is made up of a whole bunch of strategies: uh, exclusion on the one hand, but also we have nuisance, we have easements, we have covenants. All these governance devices. Uh, Devices that look at classes of uses, or even particular, uh, very narrow classes of uses, uh, are part of the way uh, property entitlements are defined. Um, and again, I'm not going to get into lots of detail, but if you start thinking about property and private law as a system like this, uh, some parts of it are more connected than others. So uh, if you look at property, uh, just sort of broad brush, the notion of possession is interconnected in all sorts of ways, adverse possession, acquisition, uh, and so forth, uh, even commercial law, whereas the notion of contract uh, is very important, but it's easier to uh, treat in isolation in certain ways. Uh, so we do, you know, if you want to talk about landlord-tenant uh, and you want to uh, treat certain contractual aspects of it, that's going to be a much more discrete problem than if you said, well, let's, let's think about another idea of possession for property in general. That would have uh, much more of an effect uh, widespread. And uh, something that I've worked on a lot recently, uh, law versus equity. Law and equity, if we take them seriously as such, are very different from each other. And that bothers some people. Uh, the true fusionists find this to be problematic. Uh, I'm not in that camp. Um, and I think that, uh, as I will sort of gesture to uh, later, the fact that law and equity can be kept uh, as different from each other as they could be, and I would argue should be, uh, helps with certain kinds of problems, that actually it is uh, beneficial that law and equity are not the same uh, and that they solve different problems. Okay, so by way of introduction, uh, now let's talk, uh, uh, that was um, the setup for three different areas that are close to IP. Uh, in, in a way, they're um, uh, sometimes, they're IP adjacent, they're maybe part of IP, in some sense they're at the core of IP because some of the core issues of IP are playing out in these areas. Uh, and the first of these is uh, con uh, conversion of intangibles, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, um, equity and then the property contract spectrum. Uh, I might spend a little bit extra time on uh, conversion, uh, partly because um, I think this is a very important interface between property and intellectual property, and it illustrates how once you dig into it, it is actually quite uh, complex, but uh, simple in other respects that allows for that to be ma uh, managed. So <laughs> uh, the hat on the rack, it sounds like a Dr. Seuss uh, story. Um, why do I have the hat on the rack? Well, I haven't had uh, a lot of uh, visuals yet, and I have to have an excuse for using PowerPoint. So here's the excuse. Um, the hat on the rack, uh, why do I say this for conversion? Well, if you look at the um, uh, previous restatements, uh, treatment, uh, and by the way, the property torts were part of previous, tor the first and second restatements of torts, and we, in the property restatement, uh, the fourth restatement of property, have snatched them back, uh, and we didn't convert them exactly, because, uh, because they were pretty much undefended. In the third restatement of torts, which is ongoing, uh, they have uh, sort of separate projects and so forth, and nobody had uh, bothered with the property torts yet. The original reason for the property torts to be in the property, uh, the torts restatements in the first and second rounds was that the property restatement itself got bogged down and there were a variety of reasons uh, back in the old days uh, that somehow uh, it, it got moved over. So it really literally got shifted over. Uh, and I have to say I'm sympathetic with the idea of being, being bogged down. But uh, the property torts, I think, are it's central to property. Uh, and so we have them back. Um, and the reason I put the hat on the rack here is that in the, th the, the previous um, restatements, the tort restatements, uh, especially the second one, the uh, idea of the, the, many of the examples that they give, and I'm not, I had a slide of examples, but I decided not against it, uh, has to do with hats uh, on rack, uh, hats on racks in a restaurant. So like if you take the wrong hat, 
are you a converter? You know, like, well, if you were immediately like, oh, that's not my hat, and put it back, you're not a converter. If you, you're like, ooh, that's a cool hat, I'll take that one, that, then you're a converter right from that, 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 that. I'm just illustrating, right? Uh, and then, uh, you know, if you take the wrong hat, not knowing it, but you get home and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the wrong hat, you're a converter, even though you're not really a bad person. You're still a converter uh, if you take the hat, yeah, it's the wrong one, you didn't know, and then it like blows down a, 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 a sewer hole, you're a converter, you know. So conversion is a little disturbing, actually, in terms of uh, what you can be liable for, and that becomes even more so when we start talking about uh, IP. So we're not talking about hats anymore; uh, we're talking about something else. So in the fourth restatement, as I said, we're doing the property torts, um, and uh, I did the uh, uh, the initial drafting on the personal property torts, uh, and as you can see from uh, this, uh, well, this part has actually gotten further along, but uh, the actual conversion parts uh, are only at the preliminary draft stage, so they haven't been voted on, uh, so input is very welcome. Uh, but the, the idea of like this basic setup of what's a thing and what's property and so forth are, have gotten through uh, the first voting stage. Uh, and um, and we're, we're not making big claims, we're, but we are, in some sense we are, uh, that we're uh, claiming that intangible items can be things, okay? So we're not ruling those out as things. Uh, and we take a kind of Hanoverian uh, uh, separation thesis. Uh, uh, this separation idea uh, goes um, back um, uh, pretty far that, uh, and very well worked out by Penner, that it has to be regarded in some sense as a separate whole contingently related to any particular actor. Okay, so something that's really personal uh, is not a thing. Uh, now, this does not say whether it's desirable for th something to be treated as property. Uh, this is a sort of initial stage. Um, but in the case of intangibles, physical separateness doesn't help. Uh, there's no preset boundary. Uh, it's not like a pen or even like land where you can, uh, you know, draw a line or a plane or, or something like that. How do we know? Well, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not indeterminate uh, completely, but it is uh, fairly fuzzy. So uh, you have to look at sort of norms and customs. Again, this is an uh, uh, interface to real life. Uh, does it have value as if considered apart from any other thing? That's not sufficient, but it's in the mix. Um, does it... Uh, consist of mutually complementary attributes. So like going back to the bundle of rights, you know, like or the bundle of attributes, uh, does it work as a whole? Um, does it really depend on the identity of the person who holds it? Uh, so this is a big deal uh, with um, rights of publicity, as we'll hear from uh, Jennifer Rothman. Uh, and is it um, commonly transferred or bought and sold on a standalone basis? Uh, and again, that's, you know, very related to contracting. It's not the same as uh, we'll hear from uh, Rob Merges. But that leads us to a big question, uh, big, big with a big Q. Uh, what about possession? Uh, so as I said, we, R4P, that's the abbreviation for fourth restatement of property, doesn't restrict things to physical things. However, uh, property and ownership can extend to intangible things by extension, but not through possession. We do not, uh, we do not uh, revise the idea of possession. Uh, we keep possession tied to physical things. Now, I know there's a lot of writing that suggests that maybe we could, you know, possession is just a technology for dealing with uh, things in terms of rights and so forth, and it can be extended. Uh, that, there's some merit to that. I think it's very difficult to do in light of the case law, and I think it, 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 it's sort of a matter of presumptions. Uh, once you do that, you have to sort of like slam a lot of doors shut that you don't want to have open, uh, and so one, way, one benefit of saying, well, possession is for intangibles. Now we can ask which doors to open as far as intangibles, and I think that's a little more under control, but that's my sort of uh, uh, view, uh, contested. Um, so uh, one of the implications, one of the doors to slam shut if you make possession apply to intangibles is, the implications for intellectual property. If you took a very expansive view of possession, uh, that could be in play. Um, but we still have to worry about how this is operationalized. If you're going, going to extend, uh, if, extend uh, conversion to intangibles, then you've got to answer some of these questions directly. 
Uh, and usually that's done in terms of control. So the standard move in a uh, you know, variety of sources is to start talking about control, but not physical control. But what does control mean? Uh, control can mean a lot of different things. Uh, and so the way to think about this is to start go back to conversion and say, you know, can intangible things be converted or to be colloquial stolen? Uh, and that uh, there, there's a lot of various case laws. So one of the rationales of restatements is that there are uh, 50, 51 jurisdictions uh, in the United States. And on this question, they do differ greatly. Uh, no question about it. Um, and that's a, a problem. Um, and it, one of the problems potentially is uh, sort of backdoor uh, IP. Now, uh, so let's just ask the question directly, how should non-rival resources be treated for conversion? What's it, you know, one is what's the object of ownership? Information, data, digital data, data files, data carriers, et cetera. What we do um, is define conversion in the following way. And I'm, not, you know, I'm happy to talk about conversion itself, but uh, the idea is that conversion is an intentional interference with an item of personal property, so that's not necessarily physical, to the exclusion of another's superior rights to control it, such that the other is entitled to compensation from the actor for the full value of those rights. Now, one thing to remember about conversion is it's basically a forced sale. And a forced sale is a, a sort of extreme remedy, but uh, a lot of this is kind of, uh, conversion is an interesting tort because a lot of it kind of works backward from this forced sale uh, remedy. Um, and the idea of conversion in terms of uh, the way it plays out in this section two is that uh, you interfere with control in a way that the other cannot exercise those rights, okay? So this is a fairly restrictive version of uh, conversion. And if we interpret it in certain ways, it's especially restrictive when it comes to intangible property. If anything, we're uh, kind of on the narrow side. Um, this is helped by, uh, this is actually kind of a little bit taken over from the second restatement of torts, uh, how you can, can commit conversion. Remember, you know, with the hat on the rack, there are all sorts of trouble you can get yourself into. Uh, so what kind of trouble is that? Well, these are the ways of com uh, committing uh, conversion, and only some of them really apply to intangibles, even potentially. Uh, dispossessing another of a thing, well, if we say the possession is uh, tangible, that's not, uh, that's not going to directly apply, only by analogy, and we would have to spell what that out is, what that is. Destroying something, maybe, you know, you can destroy data or destroy uh, any manifestation of it, uh, that's, um, that would be enough. But all these things like C through G that have to do with using, receiving, disposing, misdelivering, those are kind of problematic, uh, especially if they're multiple copies. Uh, making a thing unavailable to another is pretty extreme and can be easily imagined in the case of uh, data. Now, of course, you, uh, there is a question of like when uh, that happens and is there enough notice that uh, it has happened, uh, as uh, Chris Newman uh, is arguing. Uh, and we'll uh, talk about uh, that and uh, Christina Mulligan's uh, uh, and, uh, different idea about uh, possession. I think uh, it, it'll be very interesting to compare these different approaches with uh, this kind of uh, other approach here uh, in terms of both the substance and how you get there. Uh, but just to introduce this one, uh, the, uh, the, the originally conversion required this kind of physical interference. Uh, around the edges, this turned out to be problematic because when you think about personal property, the kinds of protections against uh, touching and so forth are l quite tricky, um, and I won't get into that, uh, but we have to do something about the possession requirement. So what, what we do, and this is spelled out in uh, horrible detail, is that um, uh, documentary intangibles, if the intangible sort of really depends on being documented in a, in a uh, piece of paper, you know, think about negotiable instruments or something, you know, you can analogize it to that. That's not particularly problematic and, uh, and courts are pretty agreed on that. Pure intangibles, though, uh, require under this approach all severance of the owner's connection to the property. So like really denying control to the, or even access to the, uh, the original holder. Uh, so appropriating all digital copies or taking a copy and destroying the original and you know, and so forth, that would qualify, as would falsifying a registry of ownership, if that's what the intangible is about, like donate, domain names and stuff like that. Now, the problem with this, as I alluded to a moment ago, is what about the downstream stuff? What happens when somebody transfers it to somebody else? How much 
uh, liability should there be, conversion is pretty harsh um, in terms of subsequent liability. Uh, but, you know, the remedy is, uh, is for sale, so we have something to talk about. So I'm not suggesting that we replace conversion with something else, but uh, in many of these in, uh, downstream situations, uh, we should use a different tool, namely, and I'm saying CF, equitable near property, which is something that I think is more familiar in the UK than it is uh, for us in the United States, uh, but I think it's a shame that it is because uh, it's a highly useful uh, idea. So, well, equitable is sometimes not familiar, but and near property is probably even less. So let's talk about what that is. Let's take a step back. Okay, so equitable near property. Let's start with the equitable part. Now, um, I, as I said, I've been working on equity for a while now, um, and I argue that there is this is not a theory of all of equity, uh, and it's not a theory of a function that's limited to equity, but a major theme of equity is to deal with certain kinds of problems of high complexity and uncertainty that traditionally came under the heading of fraud, accident, and mistake. Uh, and unconscionability would be a kind of proto prototypical example. Now, one thing that about equity that um, is not always apparent, but uh, is you know maybe worries people, like the new formalists in contract, is that it's not always engaged. It's not as if Equity is looking for every last instance of fraud, accident, and mistake with no guidelines as to what that is. Instead, I argue that if we're going to think about equity as a sort of intervention into the law, a kind of law about law or meta law, a second order system, uh, it's only, we only kick it up to the second uh, system if it's triggered uh, in certain ways. And it depends on the area of law what that trigger is, but it's usually made up of some kind of combination of bad faith and disproportionate hardship, or forfeiture or uh, undue hardship, and so forth. Uh, and that's different for different areas. So think about land, uh, you know, going across the boundary is something f relatively easy to tell. So if you're, uh, if you're deliberately going over the boundary, that's bad faith. In patent law, that's completely different. You can uh, much more easily be in good faith a uh, 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 violator there. Uh, and if you have, for instance, the combinations of uh, bad faith and disproportionate are different in terms of when to trigger equity. So if you've got pure spite, you know, like you build a wall just out of spite, you don't really need disproportionate hardship. You know, spite is like ultimate bad faith, and that's enough. Uh, and so I think that this is a, a sort of um, subject we need to develop. But when you see these triggers for equity, uh, so like violation of a commercial norm and a very disparate result, then the, question, then the idea is that the person trying to benefit from that has some justifying to do, uh, and there's a closer look. Uh, and why do we do this? Well, I said, as I said, complexity and uncertainty of certain kinds. And so I try to just, uh, sort of tease out classes of problems. This is not uh, exclusive, but problems that involve many different parties or elements that are tightly interconnected. Fuller gives this nice example of uh, dividing a bunch of paintings uh, that are left by will to two different museums and which painting, uh, you know, w if one painting is valuable depending on which other paintings you get and it, it becomes very complex. Uh, conflicting rights could be you know, like a, a nuisance setting where two people are doing something that's presumptively okay but uh, they come into conflict and nuisance law has to resolve it. And a biggie here is uh, opportunism. So somebody taking advantage of the structures of the law. So in civil law, this might be called abuse of right. Um, so uh, if the idea would be you're technically uh, you know, satisfying the law, but you're evading its uh, uh, purpose. Uh, and um, this is very familiar from tax law, uh, but it's all over the place once you look for it. Um, and uh, you, know, you can think about examples like um, you know, asking for an injunction when you just uh, bought the property in order to sue for an injunction, things like that. Which brings me to uh, building encroachments. I won't spend a great deal of time on this, but this is actually highly relevant to IP, even though it's land, because people have analogized uh, IP violations to building encroachments, and building encroachments look very chaotic unless you look at it from an equitable point of view. Uh, and uh, as a continuing trespass, a building encroachment, or that's the way it's often treated uh, in the United States, there's sort of a presumption for an injunction. It's not exactly automatic, but um, uh, the courts will pull back from that if it's in good faith. So this is a defense. It's in, in good faith and presents 
disproportionate hardship. It would be much more burdensome for me to tear down my building than it would benefit you from removing the tiny encroachment. That was in good faith. If this is in bad faith, the court will be uh, very unsympathetic and inclined to tear the building, uh, to order the building torn down. I say CF patent trolls because the, you know, the structure is very similar here, but the idea of uh, good faith and disproportionate hardship are very different in that context. Uh, so it's much easier to see how an encroachment would be, uh, would be excusable from an equitable point of view. However, in both the building encroachment uh, uh, situation and in uh, patent law or any uh, of these situations, you have potential two-sided opportunism. If you say one, you know, one side always wins, uh, then it can be gamed by the other. Uh, so if you say that, well, we'll never tear a building down, then you know, the, the person will come along and say, wow, ha, ha, it's time to do a little encroaching and I can just uh, pay my way out of it. Uh, and that, um, that's the sort of reverse. This, uh, this I'll just say in, for a moment, this is... Um, uh, I believe that uh, the, this is a Pennsylvania case. Uh, the, this is a building in Philadelphia uh, that is famous uh, for being uh, one of two adjacent buildings. The, this building encroached by like uh, one and three quarters inches onto the parcel that's uh, closer to you uh, where there was a building, um, but which has been since torn down. Uh, so this was the encroaching building. Uh, and it's kind of proper part of the property canon because it's there to illustrate this is a uh, case from the late 19th century that common law courts used to, you know, in the bad old days of the common law, when the law was the law, uh, they <laughs> tore down, they ordered buildings torn down all the time because they never heard of liability rules, uh, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, it, and it is true that the court did uh, enjoin this building, and you see it, it's still there, right? So uh, that says something. Um, but you also see that it has windows at the top. Some of them are kind of uh, bricked up and some aren't. And it turns out, so this looks like, you know, uh, injunction time. What, what happened about, you know, disproportionate hardship and so forth? Two things to say about this. One is the Pennsylvania courts used to do exceptions to equity by saying uh, the law is the law. And then the next week it would be like, oh, well, we do equity. And then it was like the law is the law the next week and so forth. And uh, it wound up actually confusing people greatly. Uh, but more interestingly, this particular dispute turns out to be much more complicated. Uh, so Brian Lee of uh, Brooklyn Law School uh, did a, uh, to say deep dive into this case would be an understatement. Uh, he actually found a, a, an engineering magazine that uh, explored this building in detail, what it was actually doing and so forth. And it turns out, and this is barely reflected in the case, but you can actually read it. You, it's, it's there. Uh, the problem was that the, they had built these windows uh, up here, and you can see there are actually quite a few windows uh, below that. Uh, and the people on the encroaching, the encroachee side here, wanted no windows. Uh, and there was this whole back and forth: is it a party wall? Is it not a party wall? And so forth. And th the negotiation was at a stage where this party, uh, the uh, yeah, the, the the pile, the encroachee, said, "Okay, I'll put up with your." encroachment if you block up the windows. And Pedrick said, no, no, windows. You know, like, oh, maybe if you build up, then we'll, you know, but for now, we have to have these windows. Is that disproportionate hardship? You're going to lose your windows if you, uh, if we uh, don't, no. Uh, so in some sense, this is uh, a prime example of failed disproportionate hardship, because actually, the, the, the enjoined party here was not put to the choice of uh, the problem of tearing down the building. If only they would brick up these these windows, they could keep their building uh, intact and so forth. And somehow this worked out afterwards. Don't hey, we, we need Brian Lee to uh, look at that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what's going on with um, equity when it comes to these um, uh, questions of entitlement and so forth? Um, so in some work, I've uh, argued uh, that. Um, in legal design, as in any kind of system that has to reach an audience, uh, you have a choice between um, uh, you, uh, reaching a, a wide audience and communicating in a dense way. Uh, so if you think about it, if you are communicating with your friends, you have a whole bunch of background knowledge, you can know how to refer to your common experience and so forth. You can speak in some sense in shorter sort of more informal ways, and you'll get your message across. Whereas if you're encountering strangers or people uh, who don't share your background, you need to spell things out. 
um, and you see this all over the place. Uh, and this plays out in, in REM versus in personam rights. So contracts can have a lot of uh, tailored detail that would not be appropriate if we're telling the rest of the world to respect uh, the right. So trespass is really s relatively simple, uh, whereas uh, in personam rights and contract rights can be interpreted uh, much more fine-grained. Uh, so this is kind of just an illustrative uh, diagram. The idea is that um, the in personam and in rem are different ways of, of, you know, if we have specialized institutions for in personam and in rem, we can uh, accommodate a certain chunk of the world in a better way. With the in rem idea, you know, you, we're concentrating on the audience size. With in personam, we're concentrating on the uh, um, uh, the the, the density of communication, and by having these, we're sort of like uh, improving the possibility of uh, the sort of possibility frontier because the trade offs are actually better in these smaller uh, institutional chunks. And what equity does is add a third one for in between, in between in personam and REM, and I'll talk about how exactly that works. But the idea is that it uh, actually improves it. Now, we don't want to have like 8 billion institutions. Uh, that would have its own uh, kind of problem. But uh, in some cases, uh, maybe, and this is not a proof, this is just an illustration, uh, we might have some benefits from something in between. So one thing that's well known is that equity modulates privity and so forth, and it sort of loosens it up in certain ways. Uh, and I don't have to sort of necessarily go through uh, all of that. One of the sort of more the well-trod ways here is for equitable servitudes to emerge uh, from equity. So something, something that's even a functionally an easement kind of comes out of this process. I'm not going to really talk about privity so much as borderline property. So some of the property question mark, quasi-property, uh, maybe property or not so sure it's property that comes along in property courses and IP courses can be thought of uh, in this way, that using this... Uh, Toolbox. So one is hot news. So INS versus AP, uh, which uh, Sham's going to talk about uh, as quasi property. Well, quasi property is not you know fully in REM, uh, but w if you go back and look at INS versus AP, it is a uh, you know it says that it is an equitable intervention over and over and over. Now post merger, we don't tend to take that uh, as seriously as we might, but if we take this as equity. Uh, equity building off of commercial morality, it might or not, it might not be a good idea, but it is um, not it is a far cry from property, um, and uh, it's somewhere in between. Uh, in a similar but somewhat different way, we could ask about body parts. So like the famous Boer case about the spleen that was um, uh, uh, the, the doctors uh, deceived the patient about and then developed a patent and so forth. Uh, the, one of the worries that the court had was, what about downstream people? If we, if we call this fully personal property and we apply the law of conversion, recall what I, we just discussed, uh, then what happens when a downstream researcher uses it? Is that person a converter too? Uh, and the court sort of like uh, used that as a reason not to think of conversion, and they uh, talked about fiduciary duty, but sort of unwittingly they opened the door to uh, thinking about equity. And you might think that Actually, uh, we could um, apply equity in some more direct sense, um, whether through the constructive trust or equitable rights and so forth, uh, so that only um, uh, you know only uh, a good faith people downstream would be uh, protected. There are a whole range of intermediate solutions that thinking in terms of equity might uh, open up, and that also applies to certain kinds of sensitive information. Uh, so. There's, in, especially in U.S. law, there's lots of confusion about how confidential information works. This extends even to uh, insider trading under the securities laws, um, tipper or tippy uh, situations, and uh, do you have to have n notice and, and so forth. And I think um, that's a potential application I've not really gone through. Now, I, you know, when you come to uh, the U.K. and Cambridge in particular, you don't have to um, talk about the, the trust in detail in terms of telling people what it is. And that's sort of like bringing coals to Newcastle if people say that anymore. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of a numerous clause of safety valve. Uh, and uh, that should be kind of interesting from a, an IP perspective, uh, especially based on uh, work of uh, Christina Mulligan. 
And the, the idea is the trust uh, allows you to mimic a property right without all the in-rem machinery. You can basically use a hybrid uh, such that the in-personam uh, right uh, has most of the effect of a property right and has mostly not the third party effects of a true in-rem right. So only, uh, you know, good faith purchasers take free. It's only the people who are in bad faith or didn't give value that uh, might uh, be subject to suit. And the beneficiary cannot sue trespassers uh, directly, you know, a beneficiary not in possession uh, and so forth. And that's one reason the trust is so flexible because it is so such a hybrid that it can do uh, all sorts of things that we associate with in rem rights without being uh, in rem rights uh, and so forth. Uh, and that's the sort of, you know, the, the tools being put together uh, have a sort of, the simple tools are put together in a way that create a complex effect. So I'm going to say very uh, little, I think, about contract property spectrum. I forgot when I actually started, so I, I'm thinking I'm getting. Uh, close, yeah, well, thanks. Uh, the, we're going to hear a lot more about the contract property spectrum, uh, but I'll, I want to just say a couple of things. Uh, one is um, that patent and copyright, uh, if we think about this in terms of um, uh, in, uh, entitlements where we have property in, uh, intellectual property entitlements, we have other entitlements that come through contracts and so forth, and how do they all fit together, the basic packages of entitlements are not all the same. Uh, so uh, in patent law, uh, partly because of the uh, way that the um, uh, the nature of the uses and their unforeseeability, you get uh, more property-like protection. And, uh, Molly Van Holling will talk about this, uh, the sort of entitlement definition being different between property and copyright, which if you look at the statute in the United States, and I've looked at the uh, the here as well, uh, it is more like a bundle of rights in the sense that it does actually list uh, rights in a way that's not true of uh, patent law. Um, and uh, the defenses and uh, remedies are uh, sort of track this distinction. Now, uh, again, to um, uh, pick up on uh, uh, what Molly will talk about, with the world of IP licenses from the point of view of users, uh, it's, it's fairly complicated, but it could be a lot worse. So uh, Creative Commons licenses had to be uh, updated and so forth so that they wouldn't conflict and, and so forth. But if you look at it from the point of view of a user, it's complicated, but it could be much, much worse. And the question is, how should the, you know, and this is a situation where a coordinating uh, group has uh, tried to keep things under control. But there are other situations where that's not necessarily going to happen and we would uh, f uh, face a much more uh, unruly situation. This looks unruly, but um, it's not what it uh, could be. Um, the licensing itself supplies a kind of governance overlay uh, to basic entitlements. Uh, that's true both in regular property, but especially true in uh, intellectual property. Uh, licenses are not contracts themselves, but they're often created by contracts, as uh, Chris Newman has shown. Uh, and they're definitely a private law category in their own right. I teach licenses every year, and I find it one of the most difficult things to teach, uh, not only because the concept, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, Porna has written about this in the IP context uh, in terms of implication. Just even in terms of private law, think about teaching licenses to students even without even getting to IP. Uh, and then uh, you uh, get uh, a, a sort of extra layer of complexity. Um, partly this is a problem with uh, the case law that, you know, what is a license, when is it irrevocable, why is it irrevocable, is that because of the contract or because of something else and reliance and so forth. Um, and uh, the whole idea of is a license a contract or is it something created by contract, what does that mean, etc., is confusing to students, but it's uh, confusing to courts. And so that's why uh, it's a very worthy th thing to think about, especially in a context of a conference on IP and private law, uh, because um, it's relevant to both. One worry we have is that if we just said, hey, licenses and contracts and hey, let's just do whatever we want, is that we could conceivably create synthetic things. You know, think about back to the bundle of rights. We could say, hey, here's a stick, there's a stick, you know, let's get some string and put them together. 
Okay, well, in land law, that doesn't exactly work because we have the touch and concern requirement. So it has to, I guess here it's, a, you know, does it accommodate the land? This is a term that we don't use in the United States. We use touch and concern, although the third restatement of property tried to get rid of it. Um, but, but if you read the third restatement, I wouldn't recommend reading it as like a novel. But if you did, <laughs> uh, you would say, wow, touch and concern, it's gone. And then you uh, actually, well, it, it, they have uh, ways of striking down covenants. But then you get to a certain section, and it starts talking about, well, how related is it to the land, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, whoa, it's, it's kind of in there. It never completely goes away. Uh, so uh, one th way of thinking about touch and concern, and I don't have the ultimate theory of touch and concern, is that it tries to manage this kind of complexity, that uh, you have to create bundles that make some sense functionally, and if you just try to put <coughs> extraneous stuff together, the law is going to say no. Uh, I did notice that in uh, the, the UK report on this, uh, that there's a footnote that says, the third restatement of property uh, uh, gets rid of touch and concern, and its overarching goal is to facilitate transactions. And then the next sentence is something like, that is not our goal. Um, so <laughs> so uh, big issues are at, at play. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in connection with the previous graphic slide, uh, you have in the context of uh, IP the potential for conflicting downstream licenses. Uh, think about the Creative Commons problems that were there. Uh, and you also have um, the idea of uh, licenses that exceed baselines that do seem a little extraneous from the touch and concern point of view. How should we think about that? is uh, kind of front and center if we think about uh, things in this complex systems uh, way. Uh, and that applies very related to lead uh, doctrines like first sale uh, exhaustion, and as I mentioned, uh, implication. You know, we, what, what are we uh, going to allow such that complexity doesn't uh, completely get out of control? And it's, sometimes it's a matter of like, using your imagination. I mean, if we had all sorts of entitlements that were conditioned on each other and so forth, we could have uh, fairly complex stuff. Or in the case of land, we have, you know, like all these reach through, uh, you know, uh, overcharged kind of life, uh, covenants that require people to go way back in the transactional chain and so forth. You know, what, what sh where should the law draw the line? Okay, so to conclude, uh, the the uh, idea of property and system should not be uh, taboo. Uh, instead, we should ha have them contribute to IP uh, as long as uh, we can think of them as uh, private law in general and property in particular as a complex system. Uh, that's a completely different game, I think. So this more articulated, uh, what I'm going to call architectural theory uh, based on complex systems, uh, helps to rationalize certain areas. Uh, you know, it doesn't answer all the questions. Uh, to some extent, it just frames them. But conversion of intangibles, equal and mere property, and this property contract spectrum, I think, are more helpfully engaged when we think of things in this way. And to some extent, I think this does point us uh, into uh, a class of solutions rather than some others. Um, and uh, again, uh, you know, we're, you know, uh, this comes back to uh, what Jonathan said at the beginning, uh, the sort of internal versus external aspect here. Um, you know, I, if we take the function of the internal uh, system here seriously, we can see how, in an emergent way, it's serving uh, particular purposes like efficiency, fairness, and all sorts of other purposes that might also be illuminated by uh, other uh, perspectives like uh, economics, moral philosophy, psychology, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so. If we can do that, then we can kind of relate the micro and the macro in these areas in a more transparent way. And I'm suggesting that nowhere is this more true than in intellectual property itself. So thank you very much. Thank you.